Welcome to this week's British Heart Foundation Centre for Research Excellence seminar. Um, we are very pleased uh, to welcome Dr. Peter Foster, who is Director of Research at the Institute of Forensic Genetics at Munster, as well as a fellow at the MacDonald Institute. Uh, Peter comes from the anthropological field where he made his name on phylogenetic network uh, analysis of human migrations. Um, he now brings to us um, his mathematical techniques to a very medically um, topical subject of um, the spread of COVID and its genetic mutations um, over the last few months. Um, so we much welcome uh, Peter bringing to us his insights from mathematical anthropology uh, to clinical medicine. So without uh, further ado, let me uh, give the floor to Peter Forster. Thank you very much for the invitation. So indeed, my lecture is on the phylogenetic network analysis of SARS-CoV-2 genomes. And uh, this is rooted in my work in the 1990s when the mitochondrial DNA genome was discovered to be extremely useful potentially to trace prehistoric human migrations colonizing our planet uh, around 100,000 years ago. The trouble at the time though was that in the 80s and 90s researchers tried to put together mitochondrial DNA into evolutionary trees to trace human migration and uh, that didn't work because many mathematically possible trees were generated by the data and it was unclear which tree was the correct one if any. So I came upon the scene as a student with my mathematics professor, Professor Hans-Jürgen Bandel and his PhD student Dr. Arne Roll at Hamburg University and instead of using trees to reconstruct the spread of humans we used a network algorithm. So let me explain this in a few slides. So we published our network algorithm uh, applied to coronavirus in uh, PNAS in April. This was an accelerated publication process given that it was coronavirus research. So if you look at the timeline here on the right, the first human genome for coronavirus was available on Christmas Eve 2019. We collected the data, 160 genomes, until early March. We analyzed these data, wrote up the manuscript in two weeks and submitted it in mid-March. There were then two rounds of referees and uh, once we had appeased all their comments, um, our paper was published on the 8th of April. The data we obtained from the GISA database, this is the leading global coronavirus genome database, it started off in 2008 as a private initiative, but um, was then taken over by the German Ministry for Agriculture and Consumer Protection. It started off back then for avian influenza viruses, uh, but because they had set up all the infrastructure, they were then in a position early this year to accept coronavirus submissions from researchers from Asia and from all over the world. And therefore, once we had registered, we were able on a day-to-day -day basis keep up to date with the spread of the coronavirus in terms of its genome sequences. And uh, this reminds me of uh, the situation in Oxford where the Jenner Institute had been working on coronaviruses for many years. And so they are now in a very good position to develop the first promising vaccine. So similarly, we see ourselves in that tradition where 20 years ago we developed network algorithms and are now able or were able to spring into action to produce the first um, evolutionary tree showing how the coronavirus has developed and spread in humans in the first few months. 
So let me uh, explain to you the basic principles of the phylogenetic network algorithm. So imagine you have the first patient who is uh, successfully spreading his particular coronavirus. This is symbolized, this coronavirus, this first successful one, by the small red circle, top left. And now this patient infects other people around him or herself. And this coronavirus type now becomes more common. And hence the larger red circle shows that now there are a multitude of people carrying this genome type, the first successful one. Now the mutation rate starts having an effect. So the coronavirus has a genome of 30,000 nucleotides. And on average, a nucleotide mutates every two weeks or so. So what we get is that the original genome type, the red one, now becomes less common, a smaller red circle, because there are now derived types evolving. So for example, this patient here, the white circle, um, has mutated at position 16,303. So the original virus might have an A at that position, whereas this patient now has a T at that position. Or if we look below, we have another type uh, where the mutation 9,429 has happened. So at that position, the original virus might have a G in that genome position, whereas the patient has an A, for example. In other words, it is no longer the original type which signals that a successful virus spread has happened, but it is the entire star-like cluster which tells us there was a successful spread some weeks ago. Now, moving forward in time to the present situation, more and more mutations have happened over weeks and months. So we run into two technical difficulties. One difficulty is that the original type might have mutated away completely. There are only derived types left. So we no longer have this, the original type in our sample. Therefore, it needs to be reconstructed by the algorithm on the basis of the existing types. The sec and that is mathematically not trivial. Now, the second problem is that we get um, recurrent mutations. That is, the same position on the virus genome can mutate multiple times independently. And this generates a lot of potential tree solutions, and then it becomes difficult to decide which is the correct one. So how does our algorithm address simultaneously the problem of reconstructing the ancestor and at the same time showing you the most likely tree solutions among the multitude of trees? So look at this here, which is in fact a network. There is a cycle here, which is a squashed uh, square, a diamond, and on the links of the square, like this position, 9,429, you see um, the mutated positions linking up the existing patients. And if we take this cycle apart, we can take away, let's say, this link here first, and which leaves the three links here of the square. And that means that is the first tree. Taking away this link leaves you this tree. Now, taking away this link instead leaves you a different tree, which starts from the ancestor here, moves over here, there, and back again. So that's a second tree solution. Or I can take away this link here, and I'm left with this tree, which starts from the ancestor from here to there, and then moves from here into these two types. So that's the third tree. Or I can take away the fourth link to give a fourth tree. In that case, the tree starts from the ancestor again and moves across here and starts from the answers again, and then moves into here. So that is four trees in one cycle, in one square. Up here, you see two more squares joined together as a domino. So again, I can leave away four links and generate four squares, four trees from this square. And uh, another four trees in that adjacent square. So that's four trees times four trees is 16 trees, minus one joint link is 15 trees. So 15 trees on the domino times four trees down in the square here is 60 trees. So this network shows you 60 trees at a glance. And that is the strength of the network algorithm over any tree algorithm, because you can see all 60 tree solutions 
at one glance and you can see immediately what's going on. You can see where the ancestor is, you can see how people have derived, and you can see which positions have mutated multiple times. And that allows you to get at some very powerful conclusions, which tree methods can't. Now let's put this into context. The methods available, as I said, are tree methods and network methods. So uh, moving on the tree, moving to the tree methods now, there are two types of tree methods. There are tree methods which deal with distance data and tree methods that deal with character data. Now what are distance data? Now if I ask you what is the difference between English and German vocabulary, I could tell you, well, the vocabulary differs by 12% between English and German. And that's a distance. The 12% is the distance between English and German. Or I can tell you English and German differ by the words for bone, because in English it is bone, in German it is knochen, which is similar or related to the English word for knuckle. Uh, and the word woman is also different. In German it is Frau, in English it is woman. And these are items, they are so-called characters. So I can tell you the difference between English and German are the words for woman and for bone. And if I ask you which information is more valuable, which is more useful, the statement that English and German are different by 12% or the statement that English and German are different by the words for woman and bone. Then you will answer me and say, of course, it's more, uh, it's, it, it's more useful to have the actual items that are different than a simple percentage. And th therefore, character data are more useful to the researcher. And the same is true for networks. You have distance data, you have networks which deal with distance data, but you have networks which directly deal with character data and display them, like I've shown you the nucleotide positions previously. And we developed two network methods. One is the reduced median network method, and uh, the improved method is the median joining network method, which we shall apply here. And this is the median joining network, phylogenetic network of the first 160 SARS-CoV-2 genomes, which were deposited in the database and sampled from the first patients from uh, December 2019 until the end of February 2020. And in this network, you will quickly see there are three clusters. We've called them A, B, and C. Now, all these three clusters in these colors are found in East Asia and specifically in China. So these are the red and the orange colors. But you also see these blue colors which show Western countries. So Australia, Europe, and North America, because the virus, as we know, arrived uh, quite soon in these parts of the world as well. So you can see derived types typically in the Western world, even at this early stage. Now, uh, we wanted to find out where the root is, and to do this, you use a so-called outgroup. So you take a, a genome or a DNA sequence, or in this case, a nucleotide sequence, which is guaranteed to have branched off before all the diversity uh, developed within the species of humans. And uh, this is the bat coronavirus that you can use as an outgroup. It's 96% similar to the human coronavirus. And uh, it shows that the A types are the ancestral types. And this was a surprise to us because the media reports at the time stated that the virus had originated in the wet market in Wuhan. However, Wuhan doesn't have the ancestral A type, or at least very little of it in these early samples. Only three out, out of 23 Wuhan samples are A-types. The majority, 20 out of 23 A-types in this very early stage, until early January, are B-types. So immediately it seems to me that Wuhan or the fish market is not the best candidate for the origin of the epidemic. So I read up the first paper in the Lancet on the spread of the epidemic in January. And indeed, it states that the first ever diagnosed patient was diagnosed on the 1st of December. 
and had no contact with the Wuhan fish market. Those contacts came later. So this is, I think, in a way reflected in the network. The other thing we noticed which struck us about this network, it is unlike the example network I showed you in the previous slide, where you see an ancestor slowly dying out and the branches getting longer and longer. Here you see the opposite. The ancestor is very well represented as for example in the B type and yet you have these long branches which seem to have taken on a life of their own. So this can mean the virus is adapting, it's changing as it enters new populations for example in the western world it is it is uh, developing mutations which are allowing it to spread more efficiently. That's one interpretation we propose in our paper in April. And the other interp interpretation is there are complex founder events going on, which mean that, for example, the B-type remains successful as it is in Wuhan and in China and in other parts of Asia without going to the trouble of mutating further. Now, with hindsight, both these explanations we proposed are correct because soon after we published it became clear that there are super spreaders some people who are producing founder events by spreading their virus in the context for example of choirs singing loudly and then infecting a large number of people uh, and also the adaptive um, hypothesis we put forward has also turned out to be true and we'll get to that later Keep in mind this long branch you see down here. Now uh, let us um, comment further on other methods which are current and therefore they need commenting. Is it useful to use the patient sampling date to determine the virus type or even the root? So as you can see our network algorithm does not rely on when the patient was sampled and our routing method uses the bat and does also not require any date on when the patient was sampled. If we now use, the, this is the same network as before, our network, now the colors don't show geography, it shows sampling date. And as you can see, actually, it's a mess. There is no clear correlation between the sampling week and the, the structure of the network. And therefore, we can quickly conclude that certainly at this early stage of the outbreak, the sampling date will confuse the tree, it won't help in reconstructing the tree. Back to our network, we have now um, a detailed network which shows you the items or the characters along the links. You can't see them because the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the size is too small, um, uh, but these blue arrows, you have to trust me, they point to four links which generate the complication in the network. It's a kind of ladder which is bent over here and which is caused primarily by a fast mutating uh, virus position. It is nucleotide 11,083. Now this mutation has independently mutated here and here and here and here, generating this ladder and generating 288 mathematically equally likely trees. Now, thanks to the network, we can see all of this at one glance, whereas 288 trees listed here, of course, would um, overwhelm our minds. Now, why is this position 11,083 so variable? Or why does it appear to be so variable? Possibility A, it is down to genomic instability. This part of the virus genome is simply instable and there's a tendency for it to mutate again and again. Possibility B, the virus seems to have some adaptive uh, advantage into mutating into this position, regardless of where it's starting out from. And therefore it happens again and again. Now, possibility A would be relevant to vaccine research because you don't want to develop a vaccine based on a position which you can mutate back and forth and render your vaccine useless. And possibility B is also relevant medically in the sense that uh, you want to study where a virus comes from and relying on this particular unstable position wouldn't give you a secure answer. So for epidemiologists, this wouldn't be, it would be 
necessary to put a warning sign on this position. It would also be potentially interesting for treatment. You also want a drug which isn't deactivated by this particular position mutating. So what is correct? Is this an instable position on the genome? Or is it a stable position, but it has an advantage and therefore the virus spreads more easily with this particular advantageous mutation and therefore we pick it up more commonly in our patient sample. Now I think potentially explanation A is correct because we see this mutation even happening within a single patient. So there isn't a clear adaptive advantage from patient to patient because it's even happening within one single patient. Now to the main part of my talk, which is the potential of the uh, network analysis to trace actual infections. And that means people can then trace back their infection to a source and this source can be put in quarantine and that can prevent the infection from spreading further. So looking at the first Canadian case, we have a Canadian here shown in the network as Ontario, this blue circle. This patient had visited uh, Wuhan and Guangdong in China, then returned to Canada and fell ill on the 27th of January. <clears throat> Looking back in time, there is an empty node here in the network, which is most closely related to the patient. And this empty node, we have not sampled a patient for it, but it's reconstructed by the algorithm. And we have a good idea of where this particular type comes from because the derived types are in Foshan and in Shenzhen, which are both cities in Guangdong province. And that matches with the travel history of the patient. So that is likely where the patient picked up their infection. And it doesn't stop there because you now see derived types from this Ontario type. So three people in California, hence the largest circle, and uh, two mutations further on, another Canadian. So this has set off its own um, infection in Canada and North America. Now moving to the next case, the early Brazilian uh, case or the first ever Brazilian case is shown here as a green circle, bottom left. This patient had visited uh, Lombardy in Northern Italy before his diagnosis, returned to Brazil and then uh, was diagnosed and reported on the uh, 25th of February. The network clearly agrees with that by linking him back to two Italians who have a type ancestral to his type and another derived Italian coming off from that. But if we're now we ask the question, where did the Italian in turn get his infection from? Um, the network shows we're not sure, there's an ambiguity here. It could either have come this way from this node also found in Singapore, or it, come, or it could have come from this uh, Chinese Australian in Sydney, and the Italian could have had his network from that group of C types. Now, if I were forced to give an answer, which of the two is more likely, I can look at the mutations, which you can't see here, but uh, trust me, this link here is our old friend, position 11,083, which mutates again and again. So it's quite likely that the Italian type comes from this C type rather than from the Singapore type. And, uh, and that is something you can do by looking directly at the positions which have mutated. Looking at the next um, and final Example, this is the frightening one really. Um, so currently we have a globally dominant type, which is 97% and more of the coronavirus patients today. Now, back when we analyzed the data set in early March, it was only 3% of our sample. It is a B type. And in fact, it is this long branch, which I ask you to remember, um, which we call the Lombardy B type. But when we sampled three weeks later on the 24th of March, the GISA database, uh, we took a thousand samples at that stage. This type had increased to over 30%. And as I said, it's now in the course of April become 
dominant worldwide. This Lombardy type um, has an ancestral type in Bavaria in Munich, and this came from a visitor from Shanghai to Munich on January the 19th. In Lombardy, this type was picked up on February the 15th, a young man, 38 years old, but nevertheless fighting for his life for many weeks in intensive care. And uh, we then have a Mexican with a first reported Mexican case. He had visited Italy, northern Italy, Bergamo. And uh, we also find it in South Germany then again, a German visitor to uh, Milan who also becomes ill at the same time around February the 25th. So this type has a strikingly long branch, many mutations developing, and has taken over the world. <clears throat> so we published this striking case as one of our case samples and immediately attracted criticisms from researchers who still prefer to use trees in reconstructing viral evolution. Um, one of these researchers, uh, or one of these teams is based in Florida, and they claim that this branch, which shows this striking infection all the way to Brazil, actually is statistically unstable. In their tree analysis, there are further Dutch, Welsh, and Italian types, which, um, depending on your chosen tree, um, can branch here, there, or somewhere else. So they show this with the arrows changing around. That means this whole idea of tracing an infection using network algorithms is, is not reliable. So we've asked for these five sequences, which they say are unstable, and they provided us kindly with these sequences. But looking at them closely, we find that these sequences, in fact, are all identical to each other and to our Italian ancestral sequence. So the fact that these identical sequences are shown here as deep branches is simply an artifact of the tree. And the researchers had failed, these Florida researchers had failed to notice that these sequences are all identical. Secondly, the researchers failed to actually look at the patient histories of their five new sequences. If they had done that, they would have seen that four of the five new sequences had all visited northern Italy shortly before becoming ill. The fifth sequence had visited Spain. So my conclusion here is please use experience and common sense in addition to statistics. But why does our genomic tracing seem to work? Well, you can rationalize it quite simply because the serial interval, that is one patient uh, infecting the next patient and the next and so on, the serial interval from one person to the next happens currently every five days on average. Now the virus mutation rate is about one mutation every 15 days. So after a chain of only about three infections, five days, another five days, another five days, you can already expect a new virus mutation and this new virus mutation can be localized quite easily in the network of virus types that we can reconstruct. And that is why this tracing back to a source of infection seems to work using phylogenetic networks. A little note of caution, however, it may work better early in an outbreak uh, than at a later stage when you need large databases of sequences in order to match up uh, the sources and the origins. But I think it is still very relevant when we have minor outbreaks um, tracing meat factories or after a lockdown where cases rise again, where you want to clamp down on sources in these minor outbreaks where in a similar condition as at the beginning of the epidemic where the networks are promising ways to trace the source of an outbreak. Another thing I won't go into here is the potential of the networks to trace sequencing errors. So we've uncovered several sequencing errors uh, using networks. Um, so it's a good way to quality control your virus genomes. Um, what I do want to focus on slightly is a time estimate. When did the virus start spreading successfully? So we used a larger database of 1001 high quality genomes, performed linear regression. This was done by my colleague, Dr. Mike Pivnenko in the Department of Engineering. 
and uh, we see that the virus would have started mutating and spreading in humans uh, at some point between the 13th of September 2019 and the 7th of December 2019. Uh, and that is the 95% confidence interval. So in other words, there's only a 5% possibility that the virus started spreading before the 13th of September or after the 7th of December. And this is relevant because one of the most common questions you will hear is, Doctor, I had the symptoms in 2019. Did I already have the virus? And this question arises every time there are media reports on early estimates for the beginning of the spread. So we had, for example, the Harvard study, which looked at hospital car parks in China, in Wuhan, and they find that the traffic increased in August 20, 2019 around these hospitals, and potentially that was the beginning of the epidemic in their view. You had the early French case uh, around Christmas 2019, a month earlier than suspected elsewhere in France. Then you have the sewage analyses in Italy and in Spain, where uh, the sewage archived indicates potentially uh, the virus present in Barcelona as early as March. So uh, every time we have these questions, we have to fall back on our time estimate to say that we don't think it's likely that there was a spread successfully amongst humans before mid-September 2019. I have to add another caution here though. Our, our estimate is, is based on a constant virus mutation rate. However, we already know that the virus uh, has changed its mutation rate. So this new virus spreading uh, in Western countries has a mutation rate of about 2.1 mutations per month, whereas the original one in December, January, February in East Asia mutated at only one and a half mutations per month. And the difference is statistically highly significant. So if, it has, if the virus has changed its mutation rate recently, why would it not have changed its mutation rate in the past? But for the moment, the best we can offer is to assume that the East Asian mutation rate is valid for the preceding months, and that leads to our time estimate of the beginning of the successful spread between mid-September and early December 2019. Now let me also add, the spread is not the same as the species transmission. The species transmission from, for example, a bat to a human could have happened at that time in, in let's say, September, October 2019, but it need not have happened because the bat difference to the human coronavirus is 4%, which doesn't sound much, but that is 1,200 nucleotides. And if you apply to our mutation rate, that implies a common ancestor 50 years ago, five decades ago. And that is a problem we haven't addressed, but as a back of the envelope calculation, I mean, there are several possibilities to explain this difference. The one is we simply haven't got hold of the right bat yet. So there might be a bat which is much more closely related and is responsible for the species jump, perhaps in 2019. Or as another extreme and completely hypothetical idea, perhaps indeed the virus was circulating in humans for decades, but for some reason has not been noticed yet, similar to the um, uh, AIDS virus, HIV, circulating in human potentially for decades before it became noticed in the 1980s. So there, there is still a lot of research necessary on the origins of this virus. I'd just like to thank the people involved in this. So GISAID, first of all, for providing the data. Dr. Mike Bivienko in engineering, who did the, the linear regression analyses and uh, my colleagues, Dr. Polsin and Dr. Rohl, who uh, programmed and devised the uh, network algorithms to a large extent. And of course, uh, my professor, Professor Colin Renfrew, who was the first to start up the archaeogenetics unit in Cambridge in 1999, and who made all this possible. Thank you very much. <laughs>